It's May 14th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories, making the headlines at this hour. Starting with the South Korea-China foreign ministry meeting in Beijing. Ju Tier and Wang Yi recognize the difficulties and differences in their own country's interests at the moment. But the two ministers managed to voice a mutual call for cooperation and moving forward together. Both South Korea's export and import prices went up for the fourth straight month in April. Due to an increase in global oil prices and the Korean ones that declined against the U.S. dollar. The Biden administration is set to impose a fresh round of tariffs on Chinese goods, highly likely including a quadrupling of tariffs on Chinese electro vehicles, a move seen as a strategy ahead of the November presidential election. The four ministers of South Korea and China have met for the first time in almost two years. They decided to continue dialogue using various channels and discussed a range of issues, including the upcoming trilateral summit between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo. Our Kim jong sheol searches off. Foreign Minister Cho tae met with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi on Monday in Beijing. His two-day trip to China came at the invitation of Wang, the director of the Office of China's Central Commission for Foreign Affairs. Minister Cho said to open up a new era for Seoul and Beijing, it's important to build a foundation for sustainable development by improving mutual trust. He said the two countries must continue developing a strategic partner relationship based on mutual respect, benefit and common interest. Director Wang said the two countries established each other as strategic partners in 2008, giving each other more important diplomatic positions. But he pointed out that difficulties and challenges have increased since then and proposed to work together face to face to promote a healthy and stable relationship without interference. In the four-hour meeting, the two sides discussed issues of mutual concern such as the situation on the Korean peninsula, including the North Korean nuclear threat, as well as the semiconductor supply chains. You can tell that the two sides tried to create an atmosphere by avoiding provocative words, and it can be read that the two sides were using the opportunity of high-level talks to create new momentum for bilateral relations. The two also discussed details of the trilateral summit between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo, scheduled for later this month. They agreed to strengthen communication using various channels. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. South Korea's export and import prices surged for the fourth of month in a row in April, driven by a strong U.S. dollar and rising international oil prices. Our Shin sae has the details. A strong U.S. dollar and rising international oil prices drove up both export and import prices in South Korea for the fourth consecutive month in April. Preliminary data released by the Bank of Korea on Tuesday showed that the country's export price index rose by 4.1 percent on month. Compared to a year ago, it rose by 6.2 percent. By category, manufactured goods saw a 4.1 percent increase from the previous month. Taking a closer look at manufactured goods driving the overall rise, prices for computers and electronic and optical devices saw a significant rise of 7.3 percent and chemical products increased by 3.3 percent. However, prices of agricultural, forestry and fishery products fell by 2.5 percent from March. Last month, the average $1 exchange rate was 1,367.831 marking a 2.8 percent on-month increase and a 3.6 percent on-year jump. The import price index for April also saw an on-month climb of 3.9 percent. This increase was due to the rise in international oil prices, with Dubai crude oil prices increasing by almost 6 percent per barrel compared to the month before. Raw materials saw a significant month-on-month -month increase of 5.5 percent. Intermediate goods rose by 3.7 percent on month, driven by increases in primary metal products, computers and electronic and optical devices. Both capital goods and consumer goods increased by 1.9 percent from the previous month. The central bank explained that with export prices rising more sharply than import prices, the country's terms of trade have improved for the 10th consecutive month.
Shin Sebyok, Adirang News. A fresh round of U.S. tariffs on Chinese goods are reportedly on the way. Now, this includes a possible move to quadruple tariffs on Chinese electro vehicles, which the Treasury Department says may be met with a fierce response from Beijing. Yi Seng Jia has more. The White House said Monday that U.S. President Joe Biden is set to announce fresh tariffs on Chinese goods. According to White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, the specific details will be announced at the appropriate time and in short order. However, a source familiar with the matter said that Biden is expected to quadruple tariffs on electric vehicles from China from roughly 25 percent to 100 percent, while raising other tariffs on key industries including semiconductors, solar and batteries. The source said the announcement could be made as early as Tuesday as the Biden administration looks to prevent a wave of cars made in China from hitting the U.S. market. Pundits say the latest decision is a move to bolster his image as being tougher on China than former president and election rival Donald Trump. Sullivan said the president and his administration will continue to address China's unfair practices that harm American workers and businesses. In response to the soon-to-be-announced tariffs, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said Monday that the U.S. could see a significant response from China. Speaking to Bloomberg Television, Yellen said she hopes that won't be the case as Biden continues to target U.S. concerns, but added there's always a possibility. When asked if Washington wants a trade war with Beijing, Yellen said that the U.S. is working to stabilize its economic relationship and does not wish to disengage from China economically, but emphasized that the playing field should be fair and China engages in unfair practices like massive subsidies. Yi Seng-jae, Arirang News. Then why is the Biden administration so determined to slap new tariffs on Chinese electro vehicles? Why now and why that much? We're joined by Chris Keskeho from VOA this morning. Welcome back, Chris. Good to be with you. U.S. President Joe Biden is reportedly planning to slap major new tariffs on Chinese EVs. Now, where is this huge decision coming from? Well, China's excess industrial capacity is a top concern for the U.S. and its allies, specific, specifically the concern that Beijing is flooding global markets with electric vehicles, solar panels, and other clean energy goods, which threatens U.S. jobs in those industries. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said the issue which threatens producers of similar goods in the U.S., Europe, and Japan, as well as emerging markets such as India and Mexico, was discussed at the spring meetings of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank last month. China exporting its way to full employment is not access acceptable to the rest of the world, Yellen told uh, Reuters in an interview in Washington, D.C. during those meetings. U.S. politicians and manufacturers already see Chinese EVs as a serious threat the Alliance for American Manufacturing says in a paper that government-subsidized Chinese EVs could end up being an extinction-level event for the U.S. auto sector. And earlier this year, Tesla CEO Elon Musk told industry analysts, Chinese EVs are so good that without trade barriers being put up by countries, they will pretty much demolish most other car companies in the world. So it's for the interests of those American firms, but really this can also be seen as an intensified effort by the Biden administration ahead of the presidential election, right? Yes, that's correct. Um, tariffs on uh, electric vehicles could quadruple, uh, go up from 25% to 100%. Now there are currently few Chinese EVs in the U.S., but officials worry that the low price models could soon start flooding the U.S. market even with a 25% tariff. Now, Chinese automaker BYD sells a model for around 12,000 US dollars in China. US made EVs can cost three to four times as much. Now, there's particular concern that China's green energy products will undermine the massive climate friendly investments made through the Democrats' Inflation Reduction Act that President Biden signed into law in August 2022. And he's made that a hallmark of his campaign on the campaign trail. You know, he's touted that as one of his major legislative achievements. Well, what a former U.S. President Donald Trump is saying that the Biden's tariff hike 
It should have happened four years ago, which means both Biden and Trump appear to be on the same page about keeping China under control. Chris, what differences are there between the two? Yes, it's very true that both Biden and Trump want to be seen as tough on China, whereas Biden wants competition with China, not conflict. He's trying to achieve this through an industrial strategy that uses government financial support to attract industry and private investment in new factories and advanced technology, while limiting the sale of computer chips and semiconductors and other equipment to China. Whereas Trump has floated the idea that lev levying massive tariffs against China will help address the huge trade deficit between the U.S. and China. And he's repeatedly claimed that Biden's support for EVs would ultimately cause American jobs, American factory jobs to go to China. Mm -hmm. Now, whichever argument plays better with the voters could be key in the November election, especially in the key battleground states like Michigan and Ohio, which have a lot of auto workers. Uh, definitely. Speaking of the uh, updates on the, the election now, in the meantime, recent surveys indicate American voters have deeper trust in Trump over Biden when it comes to handling the economy and carrying out economic policies. Why is that? Well, in a word, high inflation. I mean, inflation is the major issue for U.S. voters, inflation in the economy. Mm -hmm. 58 percent of U.S. voters disapprove of Biden's handling of the economy, which is up from 55 percent last month. And this is according to the latest monthly Financial Times Michigan Ross poll. Most Americans trust Trump to handle the economy and inflation over Biden. This is according to an ABC News Ipsos poll. 46 percent trust Trump, whereas 32 percent trust Biden. 44 percent trust Trump on inflation and 30 percent trust Biden. The economy and inflation are the issues that most Americans say will be the most important for them in determining which candidate they vote for in November. Nearly half of Americans say the economy and inflation are the single most important issues to them. Definitely. In fact, a bunch of figures that reflect current inflation over in the U.S. will be out this week, including CPI. How are analysts expecting this month? Well, let's start with the PPI, which is the producer price index and the measure of inflation at the wholesale level is expected to show the overall PPI ticked up slightly for the month, rising by 0.3% in April after a 0.2% increase in March. Economists and traders expect Wednesday's annual headline CPI rate for April to come in at 3.4%, which would mark the 11th straight month of that rate being above 3%. Inflation traders also see that rate remaining above 3% in May, June, July, and August, suggesting that progress has stalled on controlling this key rate of inflation. But for Morgan Stanley wrote in a research note that it believes that inflation's descent begins with this April CPI report that's due this week, and that would be led by easing price pressures in car insurance, rent, and health care, which could keep the three... Uh, Federal Reserve rate decreases on the table, you know, but the Fed has been waiting to see what's been happening with inflation before it starts to decrease interest rates. Right. All right, Chris, thank you so much for the report today. We appreciate it as always. Good to be with you again. President Yoon suk yeol met with the ruling People Power Party's new leadership on Monday, following the official launch of the party's emergency leadership committee on the same day. The PPP's interim leader, Hwang woo was at the presidential residence with other party members, including Florida leader Chu Kyung-ho. According to presidential spokesperson Kim Soo-kyung, the meeting comes as both the government and the PPP agreed on the importance of the ruling party taking an active role in addressing issues like people's livelihoods. President Yoon is said to have listened closely to the PPP's leadership and expressed his intent to reflect on public sentiment shown in the April general election for the government's policy direction. Hwang pledged to thoroughly prepare for the upcoming party convention and enhance cooperation with the government. 
With South Korea's online platform giant Naver facing pressure from the Japanese government to sell its shares in Line Yahoo, that's the company behind Japan's popular messaging app Line, criticism has emerged. Now, the presidential office, for its part, has vowed to take all possible measures for interests of the Korean farm. Our Moon Haedon reports. The South Korean government has spoken up to support Naver as it faces foreign pressure to sell its shares in Line Yahoo. Presidential Chief of Staff for Policy Song Tae-un briefed reporters on Monday afternoon about the government's current stance and future plans to assist Naver with the issue. The government's response has so far reflected Naver's position as much as possible and will continue to support Naver with any future developments. He stated that the government has been in communication with both Neva and the Japanese government and is waiting for the firm to make its stance clear to provide as much support as possible. Last Friday, Neva released an official statement saying that it was currently undergoing discussions with SoftBank to obtain the best result possible for the company, and the possibility of selling its shares was on the table. After a data leak from the messaging app Line last year, the Japanese government directed its operator in March to review its capital relationship with Naver to prevent it from happening again. Line Yahoo is mostly owned by A Holdings, which is a joint venture with equal stakes between South Korea's Naver and Japan's SoftBank, the firm that has been leveraging Tokyo's pressure to reduce Naver's control by slashing the South Korean firm's equity. Seoul has been called on to respond to the situation because Neva lacks communication channels with the Japanese government, whose moves have widely faced criticism as Neva is responsible for most of LINE's technology. Before the briefing, the Ministry of Science and ICT stated last Friday that it regrets the pressure placed on Neva by Tokyo and will respond firmly and forcefully to any discriminatory action against South Korean firms. It also pledged support for measures to strengthen information security at the company to address the user information leaks, should the firm wish to continue holding its stake in Line Yahoo. But on Monday, the firm's union spoke out against Naver's possible divestment of its stake in Line Yahoo, adding that the firm needs to protect the technology and know-how of its workers that have gone into building Line. Moon hye Arirang News. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan said Monday that more than 1,000 members of Hamas were being treated in hospitals across Turkey. The Turkish president reiterated his stance that the Palestinian militant group is a part of a resistance movement. In a joint press conference with the Greek Prime Minister, Erdogan also said that it would be sad to call Hamas a terrorist organization. A Turkish official who spoke on the condition of anonymity explained that the Turkish leader had meant to refer to Palestinians from Hamas from Gaza in general, not Hamas members. K-pop's expanding popularity is not a new thing, but it is indeed notable to see how more and more K-pop artists are being invited to major music festivals around the world. Our Kim bo Kyung tells us who is going where and why it's so significant. More and more K-pop artists are being invited to global music festivals abroad. Of course, it is not surprising to see major festivals asking K-pop acts to shine at the show, and we are indeed seeing more debuting at large-scale stadiums and festivals. Leading such a trend is Seventeen, the 13-member act that is joining the lineup for this year's Glastonbury Festival in the UK. The five-day festival is set to take place from June 26 to 30th, and Seventeen is booked for Glastonbury's Pyramid Stage, a first for a K-pop act in the festival's 50-year history. Lollapalooza Berlin is where K-pop fans can also enjoy a Seventeen performance as well, as the boy band has been invited to headline the festival slated for early September. Seventeen is not the only K-pop act that is having a chance to headline major music festivals. Stray Kids 2 will headline on Lollapalooza, this time in Chicago in August, for the second straight year after performing at Lollapalooza Paris last July, another first for a K-pop artist. For the Chicago version, K-pop girl groups IVE and Vicha are also invited to perform. Japan is not an exception. Summer Sonic in August is set to feature the largest number of K-pop acts in the Japanese music festival's history, with the lineup including IVE and City Dream singer-songwriter duo Akmu, Zero Base One. Adding to that, TWICE and Seventeen are expected to hold a concert at Nissan Stadium, Japan's largest stadium with 75,000 seats, for the first time since TVXQ's concert there. 
An expert says such performances at music festivals can upgrade K-pop acts' live performance skills and their brands. In South Korea, idols do more broadcast activities than concerts most of the time. But by headlining such global music festivals, they can upgrade themselves to become live performance artists on the global stage, adding more value to their own brands. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. Good morning. I'm Kim Xiong, and now we turn off to stories from around the world. We begin today in the U.S., where Michael Cohen, the former lawyer of Donald Trump, testified in court on Monday that Trump personally signed off on a hush money payment to an adult film actress. Once the former U.S. president's most loyal aide, Cohen told jurors on Monday that Trump told him to just do it, personally instructing Cohen to find the best way to pay the porn star Stormy Daniels $130,000 U.S. dollars in return for her silence on an alleged sexual encounter in 2006. Cohen said that he had rung, rang Trump twice to confirm his approval before opening a bank account for the hush money payment. Cohen further testified that Trump reimbursed him by falsely recording it as a legal retainer fee. When Trump's lawyers argued that Cohen acted on his own, he said that everything required Mr. Trump's sign-off and that Trump warned him before his 2016 campaign there would be a lot of women coming forward. Cohen on Monday also admitted to lying under the oath multiple times. Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of fraud and denies having sex with the porn star Stormy Daniels. To Kazakhstan next, where the country's former economy minister, Kwandik Bishimbaev, was sentenced to 24 years in prison on Monday for the torture and murder of his wife. 44-year-old Bishimbaev was found guilty following a seven-week trial, which included key CCTV video evidence. Footage showed him repeatedly kicking and punching his 31-year-old wife, Sultana Nukanova, before she was dragged by her hair into a room where she later died. Additional videos from Bishimbaev's phone included him humiliating his bruised and blooded wife. Days after her death, relatives launched an online anti-domestic violence petition to pass Sultanat's law, which quickly garnered over 150,000 signatures and passed parliament in April. Bishimbaev was sentenced to 10 years for bribery in 2018, but served less than three years. In tech news, ChatGPT creator OpenAI announced the release of its new AI model called GPT-40 on Monday. GPT-40, with the O standing for Omni, claims that it is able to reason across audio, visual and text-based information in real time. It accepts any combination of text, audio and images as input and can generate a similar combination of output. With an average audio input response time of 320 milliseconds, OpenAI says that it is similar to a human's response time in a conversation. The updated AI model was unveiled at a live stream event on Monday, where it guided watchers through a math equation, provided real-time language translations, and analyzed data on a graph. OpenAI CTO Mira Murati said that GPT-40 is a huge step forward when it comes to an ease of use. In entertainment news, the winners of the 2024 BAFTA Television Awards were announced on Sunday evening local time at London's Royal Festival Hall. The awards, which are given to the best in television, saw Top Boy win Best Drama Series while The Sixth Commandment and Squid Game The Challenge also won their respective categories. Timothy Spall won the Best Leading Actor for his role in The Sixth Commandment, while Sarah Lancashire of Happy Valley won Best Leading Actress. Jasmine Jobson won Best Supporting Actress for a role in Top Boy, while Matthew McFadden won Best Supporting Actor for his role in Succession.
Good morning. The sun was too bright yesterday, nearly impossible to walk around without sunglasses on. And today looks to be a repeat of yesterday nationwide with a slight rise in highs. Seoul will get up to 24 degrees, Daegu at 28 degrees Celsius this afternoon. Air quality will be normal to good all day in most parts of Korea. Then the weather will take a turn tomorrow with rain in the forecast for Buddha's birthday. It will start to rain from northern central regions around lunchtime and should rain all day tomorrow. The east coast will receive the most amount of rain with up to 60 millimeters in the forecast. And rain could continue into Thursday in Gangwon-do and Gyeongsangbuk. Provinces. The rest of the country could see 5 to 40 millimeters through late tomorrow night. And that bend of rain will bring down highs to the upper teens in the capital. Meanwhile, it's a rain free holiday for Jeju and parts of Cholado provinces tomorrow. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions. <laughs> We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. We'll be back on Thursday at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time.